Hello everyone and welcome back. In 1967, a book was published that would forever change the way nature is written about. J.A. Baker spent 10 years obsessively following the peregrine falcons that overwintered in Essex around this sometimes barren landscape. His diaries, his journals, were then collated and published into a book, The Peregrine, and it would forever change the way nature is written about. And today, I'm living in his footsteps. I'm at Bradwell-on-Sea in Essex at the Salt Marshes. And what better way to start the video than with a peregrine falcon behind me, just on the power station building. So stick around, and I'm going to show you why this landscape is actually a fantastic place to come birding, and dive a little bit deeper into what makes the peregrine, the book and the bird, so special. The Peregrine. Falco peregrinus, perhaps the world's best-known bird of prey. Famous for its mind-bending speed and agility, this apex predator seems to enjoy the open farmland and coastal salt marshes of the Essex coast. Known to nest on plenty of high buildings, from Tate Modern to many churches and cathedrals in plain sight, this is a bird that needs no help in capturing the public's imagination. And here on the power station, like many other big buildings, they've even been built their own nest boxes. Although the book actually starts talking about a nightjar, not something you'll see easily in Essex, there's plenty here to keep you busy when the peregrines aren't showing. Plenty of marsh harriers, and even the odd hen harrier. In winter here, you can in fact see three of the four resident UK falcons, the kestrel, the peregrine, and the occasional merlin. And yes, there has been a merlin-peregrine hybrid, and yes, it was called a perlin. But most importantly, there's plenty of prey. The wildfowl, the waders, the starlings, and the pigeons absolutely love this coastline until one of them spots a peregrine. Baker claims to have observed 618 prey items or kills, and 40% of those were wood pigeons. That matches up perfectly with what I've seen, but let me know in the comments down below the strangest thing that you've seen a bird of prey take. Now we can't talk about birds of prey, but particularly peregrines, without talking about their eyesight. We've all heard the phrase, uh, watch you like a hawk or eyes like a hawk, and with good reason. So there are three main differences as to how they see compared to humans. First of all, they see UV, they see ultraviolet, whereas we only see RGB, red, green, and blue, and variations on that scale. The second is that they see things twice as sharp twice as much detail in what they're looking at, which in a big valley like this, you can imagine, helps picking out a starling, a pigeon, a small rabbit, anything on the ground from two or 300 meters high. They need it. But the coolest thing is that they can see 15 times as far as we can. They literally have a telephoto lens and a wide angle at the same time. And they can switch between the two. So the next time you see a peregrine, he's probably seen you first. Their eyesight isn't the only amazing physical adaptation that these birds have got. Have a look at this picture of a peregrine that I took in Yorkshire, up at Bempton Cliffs in 2020. In their nose, they've got something called a tubercle. It's effectively a baffle. Now this stops their lungs collapsing when they dive. As they stoop, the amazing pressure that that creates from the air, this baffle, much like the intake or the cone on the inlet of a, a jet engine, it stops the air going too fast. It lets them actually deal with it instead of it just rushing through and blowing up their lungs. Not to mention, peregrines also see at the equivalent of about 125 frames per second. Humans see naturally at about 30. 
So have a look at this footage of a kestrel filmed at 100 frames per second and imagine it 20%, 25% slower. That ability to process information faster or slow it down is crucial in making that high speed kill. And here's the same clip at normal speed. For those that want to read about the science here at a deeper level, I've linked below Richard Sale and Steve Watson's books on the Peregrine. They are a must have, they're tremendous. Other than lots of hyperbole and lots of superlatives, it's very, very difficult to convey just how awesome they are to watch in flight. So I've written down a couple of my favorite quotes actually from the Peregrine. Have a listen to how he describes a peregrine hunting. The tiercel, which is the name for a male hawk, swept down from the sun like a shadow. Time and space turned under the curve of his wing. His talons struck the dove in flight. His momentum carried him on through the storm of feathers. I'm no writer, I'm no poet, nothing close, but that's the best description I have ever heard of a peregrine on the hunt. Have to mention at this point, it's difficult for scientists to describe peregrines sometimes because of the 20 different subspecies. My favorite being the peregrinator. But the Essex that Baker knew was changing rapidly. Post-war agricultural intensification was well underway and chemicals like DDT were being used more than ever. In fact, some of the behavior that he describes in his book has been suggested that it was because of DDT and these birds were in effect going crazy. The peregrine and its suffering here became a metaphor for England under threat, wild Britain under threat. Every day he witnessed the peregrines down here, he thought could have been their last. DDT was a problem because it, it forced the peregrines as it went up the food chain from the insects into the small animals that eventually were eaten by the peregrines, it forced them to lay eggs that were so thin that they would just crack. And in some areas, their populations dipped by as much as 80%. 80%. I should point out here that although DDT is commonly referred to as the primary chemical that led to the downfall in peregrines, in reality, it was one of a few cyclodienes or cyclodenes, however you say it, I've got no idea, were probably actually more powerful and did more damage to the peregrines than DDT. But DDT was memorable and crucially featured in Rachel Carlson's Silent Spring, a bestseller focused primarily on DDT usage in the USA during World War II. For some more detailed reading on the subject, check the description and the links down below and let me know your thoughts in the comments. Baker makes Essex seem like something outer worldly. And he didn't want to just observe the birds. He wanted to, in his words, live like a bird, completely immerse himself in the world and the lives of the peregrine falcon. To get a better understanding of Baker and his work, I went to the Chelmsford City Museum to see the temporary display about his peregrine obsession, Restless Brilliance. This is what I wanted to see, his binoculars. It seems strange to want to see some 50 year old binoculars, but these are his actual pairs and his scope. Seeing his field notes instantly made me think of what it would be like birding back in the 50s and 60s with this equipment. In my opinion, the highlight was seeing his annotated map of peregrine sightings in Essex and matching those up with my peregrine sightings. Although I think Baker has a few more than me, to say the least. After writing the peregrine, Baker gave up on paid work and lived off of grants and awards his other works paling in comparison to what would end up being his masterpiece. The Oxonian Review called what happened after the Peregrine a long slide into obscurity, 
as it wasn't really until after his death that the Peregrine would take its rightful place as a legend of natural history writing. Today, it's a book that Werner Herzog said, if you are going to film anything, you have to read this book. Baker's health declined, and the drugs that he took to help his rheumatoid arthritis eventually gave him cancer. As of today, there are probably more than 2,000 pairs of peregrine in the UK, a far cry from the perhaps three to 500 there were back then. They still face persecution on grouse moors and shooting estates in the north, but they've inhabited areas in the south where previously there were none. This is absolutely a bird that can enthrall even the most casual observer. It's been my favourite to watch and photograph for the last five years or more, and in the spring I will make a lot of content on the fledgling peregrines that I know and the adults' astonishing behaviour around their young. But for the time being, I hope you've enjoyed some of my favourite stills, learnt something new, and remembered not to ignore Essex when it comes to birds of prey. If you have, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.